Hi, everybody. Welcome to Nosotros, Yvonne Argot and Ana Teresa Fernandez in conversation with Julio Cesar Morales. I'm Jordan Stein. I'm a curator of public programs at CADIST. I want to let you know that real time captioning is provided by this little caption button at the bottom of the screen. And um, for the first time, we're doing this event in English li with live uh, Spanish translation, which is accessible via the small globe below. Um, for the English speakers, there's also, there's, I want to let you know there's one section later. It's a brief news clip that's actually in Spanish. And that section is going to be translated into English. So for that section, if you hit the globe and then English, along with this button that says mute original audio, you can get the translation in English. So we are we are technologically fortified today, which is very exciting. I want to thank our captioner, Lee Chapman, our Spanish translator, Romy Malagamba, Stefan, Sam Huff behind the scenes, and my CADIS colleagues who pitched in to make this program a reality. Uh, Ivan and Ana are both included in a two-part online video exhibition that Julio organized. It's on CADIS website, and this is almost something of a, of a closing party or a closing event for the show. And both parts of that show are streamable um, at the same time through the weekend. And we'll share links in the chat of how to see that. It's, it's, it's Ivan, Anna, and many more really, really amazing artists. And Julio will tell you more about that show. Um, I'll let you know that the exhibition reflects a, an anxious desire of his and, and all of ours to bridge physical and emotional thresholds during the pandemic. And this program today focuses on one aspect of that complex presentation, that of having the imagination to connect perceived opposites and the will to erase distance in an area that's really defined by it in, in countless ways. Um, the two-partedness of the program further comes alive as Yvonne is based in Paris and, and Anna's in San Francisco, which echoes Caddist's dual positionality with exhibition spaces in, in both of those cities. Um, Julio has worked with both of these artists extensively, so it should be a lively conversation, and it's a pleasure to, um, to introduce everybody now. Uh, born in Tijuana, Julio Cesar Morales is an artist and senior curator at the Arizona State University Art Museum, where he's joining us today. His interests center on issues of labor, memory, and surveillance technologies, and his artworks are in various private and public collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, LACMA, the San Diego Museum of Contemporary Art, and more. Ivan Argot was born in Colombia and now lives in France as an artist and film director. Through his sculptures, installations, performances, films, and interventions, he questions institutions, power, and belief systems. Recent solo exhibitions include Juntos Together at ASU, Radical Tenderness at Malaba in Buenos Aires, Deep Affection at Peratin in Paris, and Somos Tiernos at the Museo Universitario del Chopo in Mexico. Ana Teresa Fernandez, originally from Tampico, Mexico, lives here in San Francisco, explores the politics of intersectionality through time-based actions and social gestures, translated into masterful oil and gouache paintings, installations, and more. Operating formerly at the intersection of land art, performance, and history painting, she mines 21st century feminism, post-colonial landscapes, and the psychological barriers to empathy. Fernandez has exhibited at the Arizona State Museum, uh, University Art Museum, Denver Art Museum, Grunewald Gallery in Indiana University, Nevada Museum of Art in Reno, the Palm Springs Art Museum in California, and many more. Their conversation today will be followed by a Q&A session, so please, Get some cues ready in your minds and drop them into the small Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and Julio will, will air those um, at the end of the program. So without further ado, thanks so much for coming. Thanks for the artists, of course, for being here. And I'd like to introduce Julio Cesar Morales. I want to thank Cotis um, for, first of all, inviting me to curate this amazing um, exhibition that really also um, is sequenced almost like a vinyl record where you have side A and side B. And essentially um, Yvonne was in side A and um, Anna is in side B. And um, it was just amazing to go into the collection of Codis and look into their video archive and discover artists that I've never known and discover 
what amazing gems they have in their collection. So I want to thank Amanda for helping me navigate through the um, archive and, and uh, Fernanda as well. So I want to talk briefly about um, the exhibition, the online exhibition that really started from, from a dream I had during the early stages of the pandemic. I, um, in this dream, I was walking around the university here at ASU and I uh, was introduced to someone. And when I got too close to them to give them a hug, like, like sometimes I might do and in other times, um, this person slapped me in the face and, and then I woke up. And so it just dawned on me that um, we might be we might be going into a different um, section of life in which intimacy is no longer uh, public, publicly um, uh, available or um, is not wanted, I, I, should, I should say that. And so from there, um, when I woke up, I, I, I had these words in my head and the words in Spanish was la luz entre nosotros. And in English, it translates to the light between us. And so now we have this light between us, whether that is a computer screen when you're on Zoom or having a call, um, or otherwise we have something between us now that is not allowing that public intimacy um, to be allowable. And so that really began my, um, my curatorial thesis for this project. And so um, I would love to start with uh, Borrando la Frontera, so DJ Sam, could you actually play that for us? This is Ana Teresa Fernandez's piece.
such a, an amazing uh, performance and video and the sound, the guitar work is just pretty phenomenal. Um, I wanna invite Anna to uh, join us now. Hola, Anna. Hola, Julio. Um, you know, it's really strange, but not strange at all that recently I saw a couple of pictures from Tijuana and Playas and you know, it's still blue. You know what I mean? There's, it's still there. I mean, it, I mean, um, it, it really still works, you know, in regards to that perspective and that illusion of turning it into the sky. Um, can you talk a little bit about the making of that piece? Um, and also in reference to, to the border, um, you know, I grew up in Tijuana, so that's a very familiar territory to me. Yeah, I am about to turn, well, the piece is about to turn 10 years because it was done um, 2011. Uh, and it's amazing to think that it's already been 10 years since right. the conception of it. And it was done throughout the, one of the most massive deportations under the Obama administration. And as you see, what you see actually on the screen are train tracks. And I always talk about um, symbolism and metaphors. As artists, we pay attention to how the world is constructed around us. And so you see these objects that are perforated into the sand, and they're actually train tracks. And how often we see train tracks used as you know, this, this metaphor for exploration and cheesy music videos from the 80s and 90s on MTV of like mm -hmm. the kid with a backpack walking on like empty train tracks, right? And all of a sudden right. here they're placed vertically as opposed to horizontally to, to do exactly the opposite of the conception of what the material was born to do. So they're redressing the purpose to make these prison bars. However, because of these train tracks, people were allowed to visit and have space between, speaking about light between, light was able to come through and not only light, but the permeation of skin and for people to come from both sides of the border. And they came from all over the US, all over Canada, from Latin America. And they came to this precise point at the border because there was that uh, space between, there was this porosity between the, the fence in which people could touch, hug, kiss for the first time after decades. So it was a, a, um, one of those surprises that came, people thought, like, you see when, <laughs> when people no longer just saw prison bars, they're like, oh, the fence is breathing, we can access it. And that's when uh, families began communicating and, and merging there and having these osmosis movements and under Obama, however, all of a sudden that was, that was interrupted and they said no more. That was completely prohibited. And from then on, what happened what would happen every Sunday where these families were able to converge, they completely outlawed it. And instead they, they allowed for this one very small area at Friendship Park that's covered with metal mesh on both sides of these train tracks where people are only able to touch with their pinky fingers. Like just that's the only thing that fits through the porosity now. And that's when I decided, I was like, I actually need to do something directly on the fence because I had never given myself the authority to, to touch it because you just, it's so, there's the level of monstrosity is so enormous that you're just like, how can I, where do I begin? And I, one morning, like your dream, all of a sudden I saw blue and I woke up at 7 and 8, 7 a.m. and I was like, I need to erase it. It was like this dumb moment. It was like, duh, why don't I just paint it blue to, to erase it? And that way it can speak to people, both the inhabitants that live there that have to look at it every single day that don't kind of want to hear or see the protesters or see what's going on the people that go to visit it, to frequent it at the beach, and also the activists. And that's on 2011 when I decided to fly down to, to, to San Diego to do it with my mom. And you see with the police, the border patrol um, almost arrested me. And how did you, how did you get out of that? Uh, because I was wearing my tango dress. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, and I love telling the story uh, it's, just, just you play into much into the machista culture where you see these gentlemen like in these very tight wetsuits and like they're all like geared up and they you know I was on the ladder like crawled up on the ladder painting where I had the, the sirens and like on the loudspeaker this like massive pickup truck is like flying down the beach mm -hmm. and they're like 
get down from the ladder. Stop what you're doing. Don't move. And I was like in my dress and stilettos, I climbed down and they're like, no debería de estar haciendo esto, señorita. And so just mm -hmm. noticing those um, details of right. the use of the señorita was like, I was messing with their head because I was wearing high heels. Like I wasn't wearing tennis shoes and a hoodie. So they wouldn't address you as señorita if you're wearing a hoodie? I don't think so, wearing no. Wearing jeans and a hoodie and sneakers? No, I think that the señorita was because like I, 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 I was confusing them visually. They didn't know mm -hmm. how to treat me because I was like in formal wear while painting the right. fence. Did you ever say that you were an artist working on an art piece? And, and excuse me, I, I should have uh, asked Yvonne to join us as well. So sorry, Yvonne, can you join us? <laughs> yes, here I am. Hola. Hey, hola. Uh, what, what did, so did you, did you ever say in that conversation that you were an artist? Yeah, that was, I mean, after probably a couple of minutes where I, when I noticed that they were using the señorita, I was able to, to change the the landscape of the conversation and to be able to articulate like I was like first of all I'm Mexican I'm not you know I'm not an American I'm a Mexican I'm trying to do and I realized that the shorter police that you see in the video mm -hmm. he he leaned into the the concept of it oh he kind of he he started he's like oh I I could realize that the other one was just more had this like bravado but the shorter one um he squinted at it and looked at me and squinted at it. And he's like, oh, I kind of get it, you know, like, <laughs> and so I started conversing more directly with him. Right. And that's 45 minutes later, I was like, listen, just let me finish what I started. And he's like, I, ja, also, ja. <laughs> ja, <vete. laughs> ja, ja um, okay. My last question is how did you choose that color? And, and it, does that color have a name? at the paint store, you know, when you buy paint, it usually has like, you know, flamingo pink or like, you know, lemon yellow or whatever. Yes, but yes. How, how did you choose the color? It was- and What was the name of the color? It's, uh, yes, so we, my mom and I went to the Home Depot and we literally grabbed every single blue Pantom chip, you know, from the, from the display. We ran out, we saw, we were looking at the sky, like holding it up to the sky realizing that in Tijuana, la bruma, the broom, um, like the mist on the ocean is mm -hmm. like ever, ever present. And so there's a grayish quality to it. And there was this one color ironically made by uh, Martha Stewart at the time when she was in prison oh. and it was called Seashore Dreams. Wow. And I was like, I like the irony of this. I'm like, I should take you know, tell uh, Martha Martha Stewart that she can paint her way out of prison or how to like make <laughs> That is amazing. And, and I'll just add um, in closing for this section that you've gone on to paint several other border fences in, um, in Texas and in Arizona, correct? That is correct. Yeah, we, we did it um, one in Nogales in 2015, thanks through the uh, ASU Binational Residency. And then Along with uh, Border Arpe, we did, you know, from that, there was a reporter that saw the news when it went viral. And he's a journalist from Juarez. And he said, can you come? To, he just wrote me. He's like, when can you come to Juarez to do it? <laughs> and I was like, OK, give me a couple of months. And thanks to him, like he coordinated wow. in Juarez. And then I realized that people in Mexicali were interested. And then in Agua Prieta, and so we said we decided to do this oh. very like guerrilla tactic where we do it the same day in the same morning, and we live streamed it all around the world uh, because it was being okay. filmed and live streamed back in the day where live streaming was really hard to like get together, like put together. Right. Yeah. Uh, but no, it was filmed and it was live streamed in Paris. It was live streamed in Arizona, uh, in Mexico City, in Prague. Yeah. So. It was really incredible, and it, it become you know it became this like guerrilla action of doing tactically three locations at once. Well, so I mean, we were able a, to perforate it as visually. a citizen of, of the border and growing up in the border. I, I really appreciated you making creating that interaction in that piece. Um, and Ivan is joining us now from Paris. Hola, Ivan. Hola. And so Ivan was part of the uh, first uh, side A of the compilation of videos. And the, the first ones were actually longer based videos. Each one was more than, than 20, um, each one was a little bit more than about 15 minutes. And um, 
And I, uh, I had just finished working with Yvonne recently here on a, on a big solo show um, that was his first uh, US Museum show, solo show. And I loved his films and I love how interdisciplinary he, he is with sculpture, um, with film, um, with his works on paper and his paintings. And so I, I immediately fell in love with Yvonne when I saw his work at Desert X um, several years back. And so um, it was a pleasure to know that Cottis had just acquired when I was working on this project that they just acquired as far as we can get and so do you wanna, you wanna talk a little bit about that, that video or the film project? And then we'll show the actual trailer that is three minutes long. Um, hello everyone, um, good to see you again, because we met before. You public doesn't know it, but I know it. No, um, just to say a word about the film. Uh, this is a film that I made in between two cities that are actual antipodes in the world, so there is, only um, six pairs of city that match that act, are actually actual antipodes. So if you make kind of a hole and you cross the planet in a straight line, you end up in another city. So there is only six pairs of these cities. And one of these cities is in Colombia and the other one is in Indonesia. So the one city in Colombia is named, named Neiva and the one in Indonesia is named Palembang. So I wanted to make a kind of a fictional documentary in both cities and kind of try to touch, make them touch. Uh, just this, these two places are like the, the farthest place for each other possible. So the, and I wanted just to, to see how close we are the, in, even if we're in the other side of the world, we share so much history, we share so much, so much things as humans as historically uh, in terms of like, colonialism in terms of economics. So, so I made this film that kind of make a kiss in between the two, the two cities and by making this kiss to kind of disappear the world, you know, like what is the thing is between us is just the whole globe. So what if we touch, kind of make disappear the whole sphere or something like that. Um, so it's just this big image of kind of the, the planet we're living and then yeah, make this kind of connection in between two distant places. And, and also, um, this is the film you also worked with um, actors uh, that, that were born in 1989. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I, made, I made press, I made like, uh, I pay like in the, in the local press, uh, like announcers, how do you say that? Uh, and I was looking for people who were born in the day the, the Berlin Wall felt like uh, kind of a major, major, historical event and uh but i wanted i wanted just to point out that 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 kind of storytelling of that kind of narrative is part of kind of the western uh culture i mean if, of course it was important for all the world but it's uh sometimes in some places there are other things that are also very important um so i want to just to like using that as so I met people who were born the same day, exactly at the same time in different places, in like opposite places in the world to prove that sometimes the history we share is not like the main storytelling history, but it's like other little histories or the little stories, family stories, cultural stories. So I was just talking to them and not talking at all about, about like Cold War or, uh, 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 you know, the world history, but just talking about their lives and see how they're connected. Excellent. Um, Mr. DJ Sam, can you, can you play that for us? Mi nombre, Humberto Guevara. Nacido hace muchos años allá en la ciudad de Bogotá, al norte de donde estamos actualmente. Posteriormente, por asuntos de trabajo, me trasladaron a la ciudad de Cali, en el Pacífico colombiano la capital del cielo, como le dicen a Cali. De ahí duré siete años y luego fui trasladado a Medellín, donde estuve varios años también, y luego trasladado a la costa norte con sede en Cartagena, la capital de Bolívar, exactamente hacia ese destino. Luego, de regreso, volví nuevamente 
a Neiva, capital del departamento del Huila. Neiva, estamos por ese lado. Y ahora estamos acá, exactamente. Y de Neiva, acá exactamente donde estamos en este momento. Pero yo quiero compartir una canción con ustedes, al otro lado del universo, precisamente. Y precisamente, qué rico poder compartir con ustedes, para la gente del otro lado del mundo, una canción muy hermosa que se llama Un beso y una flor. Y dice así. Dejaré mis tierras por ti, dejaré mis campos y me iré lejos de aquí. Cruzaré llorando el jardín y con tus recuerdos partiré lejos de aquí. De día viviré pensando en tus sonrisas, de noche las estrellas me acompañarán. Somos Serás como una luz. Que alumbre mi camino. Me voy, pero te juro que mañana volveré. Jadi ini tentang sesuatu yang lain, bukan ini adalah tentang persamaan, tentang sebuah pertarikan dan tentang kemerdekaan. Las penas pesan en el corazón Más allá del mar habrá un lugar Donde el sol cada mañana brille más Forjará mi destino Las piedras del camino Lo que nos es querido siempre Cinta, cinta, cinta. That is such an excellent film. Um, I, I hope that that audiences who are here today actually go and actually um, look at the videos. I mean, it's a really um, beautiful sequence and um, that video is about 23 minutes I believe and um, it's really worth um, checking out the whole the whole um, the whole uh, project that Ivan uh, created um, I want to go and talk more about um, what we previously were in conversation about which was we talked about the dream the light the pandemic presence um, you know how, how do we how do we how do we deal with the pandemic as artists? Um, and I think that uh, we, we asked this question when we um, got together last week and everyone had something to share. So I'm wondering, um, do you want to share something um, in regards to, to that subject matter, Ivan? It's been a long year, a lot of learning of ourselves, I think. Um, being scared, caring about people. I think the important thing we have to maybe uh, take out of this is like we care about each other. So we understand that like we care about others and we uh, it's necessary to be in touch with the people you love, the people you care. So I think there's something that's very important that I kind of uh, learn again. Um, I learned again also to, um, to appreciate the contact with others. I learned again to uh, also to be more just by myself which is was also interesting and also I learned again to uh to slow a little bit the the, the rhythm which yeah. was also very interesting mm, to just be more focused in some projects that matters instead of like running after the wind something like that so I, I guess that's the I kind of I, I want to take the kind of the things I learned from that and as a we I like 
it's been difficult like my family in Colombia we had some difficult times also I have a large family so and uh, and even actually the pandemic right now is causing really uh, awful problems in my country so which are about like in between like a government that is not very responsible and uh, like the whole pandemic um, mixed makes a kind of um, explosive mix that is not oh. very good and in the past days you i don't know if you've seen but right. it generated a lot of conflict in the country people go out to protest and the government reacts with the strong force. like, like yeah. shoot at people and stuff so general of kind of things so i started by the good things and i end up by the bad things <laughs> <laughs> and i know you shared with us last time something that you a, a short video you made just because you wanted to feel that kind of intimacy with, you know, a lot, a lot of Yvonne's work are interventions, public interventions. For example, there is a project where he would just go around the city and touch someone's um, back or, or their arm and, and just say hello, or he'll yell at a crowd of people and he'll say, I love you. Or, you know, I forget how you say that in French, but, and so, and then he captures the people's reactions when they turn around and it's really amazing to see those reactions. And so knowing that he did that type of work, I was really interested in, in this way that he was trying to reconnect. And um, can we share that video? Um, can we shake okay. hands? Donc j'essaye juste de saluer Alors, les gens peut-être de vos ombres, si on peut se oui, dire bonjour bien avec bien vos ombres. Un ouais, 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 voilà. On essaye de... Alors, Alors est-ce qu'on arrive ou pas ah, Il faudrait que je me mette peut-être ici. Non. non. non c'est bien, regarde, voilà, mets-toi là, Charona. Non. non, faut que ta main elle vienne vers nous. Voilà, Et là, voilà, est-ce voilà, qu'on arrivera à se toucher ou pas Attends, 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 bouge pas. Bouge pas. Ah, voilà euh... <rire> Pas le pas mes têtes, hein. Alors... <rire> Non, voilà. il va, en fait, il va... Non, c'est comme ça, ouais. Voilà, bah, c'est juste ça, se dire bonjour comme ça, comme ça, on peut se toucher, bonjour. Donnez-moi <rire> votre Facebook. Oui, bien sûr. C'est très gentil, vous êtes les premiers. Il n'y a pas de quoi, monsieur. Mon neveu, elle est colombienne. Elle est très, très jolie, très belle monsieur. femme. Ouais, on est tous très beaux. Euh, non, je rigole. Ouais, <rire> non, je rigole. Euh, <rire> Et c'est tout simple, en fait, j'essaye de juste serrer la main des gens, mais avec l'ombre, comme on ne peut pas se toucher. Est-ce que vous serrez d'accord On peut... Bah, allez. Donc c'est juste euh, essayer de coordonner euh, nos ombres. Bah, allez pas trop derrière parce que vous allez tomber. Je viens plutôt, sinon je viens comme ça. Ouais voilà. Peut-être attention. Qui passe messieurs. Voilà. Voilà. <rire> c'est tout. Merci beaucoup. Et en gros j'essaye de, de dire bonjour aux gens en, en se touchant la main mais avec l'ombre. Est-ce que vous serez d'accord Il y aura juste votre ombre, votre ombre. Alors essayons. Je sais pas si vous. Alors est-ce que. <rire> ah voilà, ouais, c'est bien, ouais. Je suis nouveau à ça, alors. Ah, faut pas qu'on la touche. Voilà. Bonjour. <rire> voilà, merci beaucoup. Bon courage, bonne continuation. Bonjour, excusez-moi. Euh, je suis en train de faire une petite vidéo où je dis juste bonjour avec les ombres, avec les gens. Est-ce que vous serez d'accord de me serrer la main, mais avec votre ombre Juste... Euh, si, alors... Euh, fait, faites attention, ne tombez pas à l'eau. <rire> euh, sans se toucher, sans se toucher. Voilà. Bonjour, j'espère que vous allez bien. Bon courage pour la suite. <rire> Excusez-moi, bonjour. <laughs> Allez, uh... <laughs> how, long, how long did you do that for? Um, three Was days. Like one, four, four days? Three, three days, more uh -huh. four days, maybe. Yeah. So yeah. we were allowed only to go out one hour per day. Mm. So I, I, I used that hour to, that was like back in April. Mm -hmm. um, so I used that time to, It's I can in my neighborhood. There is this canal that's very nice, and we had the luck to have sun. 
and then yeah it was this it was completely forbidden you know you were still very scared about the virus and everything so you can see people wear gloves and stuff and mm-hmm. there's this idea that you have the feeling maybe we still have the feeling we cannot touch anymore uh uh so it was this idea of like okay let's try to have contact again contact again yeah it's a very you know beautiful political i mean um poetic way of of, of you know being in touch again in that mm. sense um and and um part of that is is sort of like where, where we found ourselves and this kind of strange times and i know that last time we, when we got together we we're talking about and i was talking about fiction and then we went on to talk about science fiction, invisibility, um, border crossing. And so um, as another public intervention, um, I um, wanted to see, Anna, if you could talk about Somos Invisibles, and then we can watch a clip from that. Yeah, I just wanna, I, 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 was, I had this big uh, epiphany when I was watching um, Ivan's piece right now, and it just, the, the word like romancing humanity came up for me while I watched both of his films. That there's something about like, you know, when you when you feel like the 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 electricity of like falling in love. But I think that sometimes we forget to do that with humanity, mm-hmm. like at that level, with strangers, with our surroundings, with the people that pass us by all the time. And I feel like that there's these moments that feel very much about both falling in love, but also like when you have these fights, which is this pandemic, how do you start that romance again? How do you get through the fight and like mm. get in touch again um, with that vulnerability um, after you've been like scorned? Um, and I think that there's, 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 <laughs> sorry, Ivan, I just got like no, this no, like no. poof. But I think also it has something to do with seeding or let, let things go away from out of control and kind of let, the other one affects you uh that well, actually, i think love is is that actually love is like not control like leave a part of control and then just see or concede well uh, you th- it's you meet something that you don't know and it's you have to let go to see where you are taken or where you you yeah. find yourself knowing things about yourself mm-hmm. through this letting go and i think that's the beautiful part of falling was, in love i was very shy and like even not not myself, but I I felt people would be scared of someone strange talking to them and asking them to do that, but almost no one say no to the shake hands with the shadow, which was also strange for me because it's not like Parisians are known for being like the, <laughs> the nicest people in the world. Uh, they are quite nice. They're nicer than people believe. That even though like with the fear of getting sick and stuff, I wouldn't believe people will react like good or uh, be able but it was it was it was actually very nice <laughs> to do yeah it's seeing them when you when you when you let people know that you're seeing them in a way that feels mm. uh unique i think that that's where you allow for people to 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 fall in love with you and vice versa you know mm. i mean is, is is that part of what you you think about Ivan, with your ideas of radical tenderness you know, with strangers that, you know, as Anna mentioned, that you're allowing them, you're seeing them and you're allowing them to also be seen in that sense. But I think if you allow yourself to uh, think the, the world that's around you in other terms out of competition or uh, uh, greediness, I don't know how to say, but it's like if we think the world in a uh, let's say a tender way if there is tender politics what does it mean and like, mm-hmm. what you take care of other with like you give uh, comfort to others uh, right. that could mean that like, that could be in a law that could be in a conversation that could be uh, in a song that could be in different ways it doesn't need to be only like a, a physical gesture uh, it could be like so that's what that's why i think it's into this notion of like we always think our time in terms of like progress, competition, like a sort of pointless evolution, but um, there are maybe other ways. Uh, I would yeah. mean, not, not, not only tenderness, but what if we, what could be mean to make up tender politics or something like that? Right. What does it mean to do that? 
I mean, tender politics, I think really it's a great segue <laughs> into Ana's um, intervention, Somos Invisibles. Can, I know we're running out of time already. It feels Sorry, like can, I just, can I just throw a little, one Go more ahead. thing? I promise I won't okay. be long. But th just because you said the sci-fi thing and yes. because of um, Ivan's work, I just wanted to, there's this like a, a background behind the scenes information, but Greg Reinoff, the, the guy who edited and filmed me for Erasing the Border, he actually won a bunch of Emmys because back in the day, he was the the, the editor for Star Trek and he was oh, well. the, pe oh. the person that made people go through walls. So he's yeah. like, who later became a documentarian for yeah. the border. And when I asked him to film this, like much later, years later after the film, like went viral and stuff like that, he's like, you know, I worked on Star Trek. That's how I'm able to do documentaries now. And my one thing that got me like five Emmys was like making people walk through walls. And I was oh. like, oh, well now you got to do it. And so this invisibility of yeah. like creating this amplification yeah. of spreading worlds. Anyway, so now you can go into the video. Just had to drop <laughs> that little thing. Um, so this is Arlene Correa Valencia, whom we, I met um, when I was in Aspen. Uh, doing this teaching workshop, this really she, she teaching workshop, and she happened to be a scholarship student. And she was making these beautiful paintings about the workers in her community in Napa. And we kept in touch. And years later, she posted this, um, this story on Instagram. And she said, you know, I hate that we're not voiceless. We're not invisible. We do not need you to speak for us. We have a voice we can speak for ourselves. And the beauty of like the light between us, right? This 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 way of communicating through Instagram. Um, all of a sudden, at, throughout the pandemic, I was teaching myself how to sew and how to knit. And I said, Arlene, if you could wear your voice, what would it say? And she said, we're not invisible. And so I said, give me a hoodie or a sweatshirt or a sweater, bring me and tell me what, you know, like I'll, I'll, I'll knit you the word or the phrase onto it. And the image you see in the middle, she brought me this hoodie that she bought at the Napa flea market, which is where all the workers from the fields go to buy their, their high-vis uniforms because the, the wineries don't pay for their uniforms. The undocumented people have to buy all their stuff so they're seen at night. Anyway, so she bought this hoodie. She brings it to me. She's like, can you please do it in orange thread? And so I knitted it for her. And then as I was knitting it, I said, Arlene, hold on. I think we can actually make this really legitimate, like actually make it so it looks like construction mode. And I bought all this stuff on Amazon. I showed up in her studio and we started to just to like play, like riff visually. And I was like adding a strip. And what we ended up is with the hoodies, next slide please, which are what you see here. And so when we were, when I got invited through Art in Action to do a campaign to get people to sign up for the census, I said, listen, I have this hoodie. And they're like, what? And I'm like, I have this hoodie. There, it reflects and I think we can use it. And what if we pimp out these ironing boards? And they're like, can you put it all in YBCA? And um, that throughout the pandemic, we're like, no, 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 we're gonna go to communities and gift them out as a way to incentivize people to sign up for the census. So Arlene and I like filled our cars with the burros, with the hoodies that we just handmade and went and actually people from these communities, next slide, were the ones that like already wore these hoodies, these colors. So they were super stoked to not only get the hoodie, but I was, they were, were also like signing up for the census for the first time in ever. And then we actually made a shirt and took it to different soccer teams. Um, and so these are girls from San Bruno, like the, the um, Latinx community here in the Bay Area. And then next slide. And this was probably one of the most powerful moments through the pandemic where we actually, through the fires, in the time of the fires, uh, where the undocumented workers still had to work through the night, uh, we went out and we tried to get them to sign up for the census. Um, and we got two, but, uh, it was still a really, really meaningful moment where we, they were so excited that, first of all, these two women were running around in the fields, like at 2 a.m. in the morning, like gifting them these hoodies and trying to get them to sign up. And that was, I can't remember if there was a video with this or that's the other. Um, that, was the, that was the, oh yeah, that's the video. And so that, that really was a really powerful 
community piece that you that you did there. Um, are you still con continuing um, working with community uh, in new programming or uh, new uh, um, ways of working um, through, you know, what you mentioned as being invisible, too visible? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you, are you gonna share the video or? This one right here? Yeah. Okay, yes, we are. You wanna do it? Okay. Sure. Ana Teresa Fernandez is artista, activista. Ana is an artist, activist. She was born in Tampico, Tamaulipas, Mexico. At 11 years old, she moved to the U.S. And since 2011, the migratory crisis uh, took him to her work. She erased the border between Arizona and Texas by painting it as an extension of heaven, where many caravans, migrants arrived. She works for social justice and to give voice to the migrants, to the workers. Her most recent work is an intervention within the lines of the ex-president Donald Trump. These 120 pieces tables that say truth in order to talk about uh, COVID, justice, and migration. I, together with other artists, Arlene Correa Valencia, so she's on the commented, we created these hoodies, and with burros, we went during COVID to different communities, so where we gave them these t-shirts for essential workers so to make them a part of the community right Ana Teresa that was great yes so we need to go Ana Teresa but it, one sentence if you had Donald Trump in front of you what would you say to him in one sentence what would you say this is how you build community by giving a voice to every single member of it I had to take a second to not say like fuck you motherfucker but I was like I don't know what I would say. Shall I? Shall I? And, and that's a weird, like, he, he kept talking over you as well. Yeah, I know. That, is, that was very odd. TV, TV. TV, yeah, anyway. But yeah, so we, we took the, the it was super early- cool. Super that, cool. Early that brought, great. We, 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 that those, those shirts have migrated all over the US, which was, has been phenomenal, and, and to Mexico too. Um, and and the tables that interaction, how long did that last? It's still it's still up. Oh really? Oh well. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I know we run out of time, but I, we also wanted to share um, one last project with with Ivan that he's currently working on for his show that's coming up at Perotin Gallery in New York. Um, do you want to set this up, um, Ivan? Uh, it's a fiction, like, I don't know if you use that term in English, anticipation film. It's, uh, so I work with a group of militants here in Paris around some, I've, I've been working around monuments or like in the past 10 years, um, making interventions on monuments, sometimes making them disappear in different ways or um, like always asking the question of their authority and their val like validity, why they are here, what do they mean, what do they mean, and then stuff. So I start working around um, a specific monument of Joseph Gallini, a military guy in, who was a big kind of um, uh, ideologue, or how to say, like, yeah, uh, of colonization, French um, colonization and domination of different colonies. He wrote a text that is named uh, The Politics of Race, in which he, uh, it's a manual on how to uh, destroy communities and dominate uh, communities in the Caribbean, Africa, and Asia. So he has this monument here in Paris where you see uh, he's just walking proudly and the pedestal is uh, actually for women uh, half uh, naked or from, with, from four different races. So there is one like black women, one Asian women, one like Caribbean women, and one kind of European women holding him with her arms. So this um, many group of militants are have been trying to um, replace or remove this monument or make them move somewhere else, like in a museum or something. And they came to me and asked me to do something about it. So I just, I didn't precisely want, I didn't want to do a, like a, like a, it's like a intervention that would be taken out, but I was just trying to imagine the day where this statue would be gone like uh, for a, a kind of in a calm way, like in a kind of even bureaucratical way, like let's say the city of Paris and the government decided to just remove it to and make open the space to do something else. 
So I imagine that day, and since it ha it's not going to happen very soon, I just made it up. So I created the date up, and that's the video we're going to see. Look, I found the clothes. I have, I still have them here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so very, actually, very much in just, line with Ana Teresa's colors. Yeah, we just dressed up like this as workers, and it just in front of the a military building, and just because we were dressed like that, they never stopped us and they never did anything. Yeah, I think that that those colors somehow authorize us to to not render them visible just because they're. It's the color of like, I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to work here. I'm, I'm a worker, like leave me alone. And yeah, I don't want to do this, I have to. Yeah, we're, <laughs> trying to, we're trying to not see them almost in a funny way. But Ivan, you also had some bureaucrats uh, set up in, the, in your shot too, right? Uh, we, hired, we hired some extras that looked like politicians or uh, yeah, bureaucrats. With, and we made a casting work. and we hired them so they look as they were doing something official. I love the briefcase and the... the... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and can you tell us where it went in regards to the sort of news element of it or the fake news element of it? Yeah, well, no, th there was another part because the militants I was working with, uh, I, at the same time, we wanted to give like... Uh, um, to make a create a polemic about it and create a debate, uh, because actually in France, uh, I don't know in the U.S., you you've seen many statues being removed and right. it's not it's not anymore like a rare thing. But in France, I don't I haven't seen a single one, so it's a, it's a completely different relationship they have with patrimony and with history. They're kind of very proud of the history they have, and they're not allowed they know they don't allow themselves to criticize it. So uh, we collaborate with journalists and we, they, we created this article that went around saying like the city decided to remove the statue and we, they put that on, we put that on Twitter and it went out like very quick, it got <laughs> like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 views and we start having different kinds of reaction. The far right wing was start like, blame. many people actually celebrate the gesture a lot, many, many more that I expected. expected. And then at some point in, I don't know, four, three, four hours after the city hall sent someone to make a picture in the spot to see if the statue was there or not. So that was actually a very funny to see. So in, they made a kind of a press release where they say like, the, we have a proof that the statue is still there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and this is a sort of scam and... I want also like I was thinking a lot about like Orson Welles and the story about world uh, the war uh, war of the worlds world of the worlds and then like say what if we make a kind of a piece like that but doesn't necessarily talk about like fix science fiction stuff but like colonial stuff post colonial stuff and post -colonial anti colonial science stuff fiction. yeah um, I know that we're running a little bit over here but I know we do have a Q and A button um, on this uh, webinar. And so I'm just wondering if um, we should go into the questions. Jordan, can you can you guide us? Yeah, there are no no questions have come through. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is very clear. That's right. It's all. It couldn't be sharper. Um, it's uh, last last call for questions here, or else Julio, you can um, 
I know I know you've got more to ask, but if anybody if anyone has them, this is uh if there's no questions. I want to say hello to my mother, to my aunt, <laughs> to, my, <laughs> to my friends in Colombia, to my <laughs> I, I, I don't have a question, but I have another observation. And I think that this is, Julio, I think I yeah. brought this up last time when you and I had a conversation probably about three years ago at the Art Institute. Mm -hmm. um, when I said that you, you have, um, I love always observing who you work with. And with women, you, you tend to pick working with women that are very like sharp and strong. And there was this, there was this moment when we were first meeting where I was like, <laughs> this is not going to say anything negative about you, Ivan. The opposite. <laughs> no, but I think that there's this, I think that there's this focus sometimes that I've, I've witnessed where you work with men that have this courage to be much more sensitive and much more vulnerable. And that's one of the things I, I've, I've really appreciated about spending time for this panel was actually what like witnessing like this this unraveling of this like romancing humanity where i'm like mm. wow this perspective that's just so soft and there's a there's a coyness about it but it's also very endearing and strong and courageous on this other hand and so i think that i think you tend to pick people that are very courageous in very different ways that define courage these days um, and so I want to, I want to thank you for that because it, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure and, and, and Ivan, it's been super great getting to see mm -hmm. and getting to know your work and like making Same me like fall that. in love with, with humanity <laughs> through your work and your, Same your moments. No, oh, let's touch it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for, for that observation. And, yeah, and that's very sweet. You know, I, I, I try and, and, same, and same collaborate myself. with artists, yeah. To, cool. you know, have a lot larger understanding of how we can impact, have an impact, you know, on, on social justice issues, but also, as you said, just even romancing strangers mm -hmm. in that sense, to me, that's, that's magic, you know, and I love magic and we need more magic and we need to dream more, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, there was one question here on the panel, uh, on the Q&A. What statue, Yvonne, what statue do you want to tackle next? <laughs> uh, I know in the past days, some in Colombia, there's been tackling statues a lot. And um, uh, indigenous communities has been tackling statues. So it, I feel it's very, um, it's very interesting to see uh, kind of uh, the country waking up out of uh, kind of submission. Mm -hmm. So I personally, uh, I, would <laughs> I would love to make levitate some obelisk or from ancient, like of all, all of these war trophies that are in these major uh, cities in Europe. Sometimes I feel, I dream about like make them fly away and go somewhere else um, kind of, but uh, yeah, no, actually I have some. Uh, I made, I'm making these little drawings of this. They're not, those are like fictions. There are statues that hasn't been removed yet, but I make them fly in a drawing. Yeah. Uh, so there, I wouldn't say there's once. Uh, I, maybe I, there, yeah, there is this one in Colombia. It's uh, Francisco de Orellana, uh, a guy, he has a monument in Bogota and he's supposedly the guy who discovered the Amazonian forest all by himself. So there was already people living there, but he's the one who discovered, and it has this little statue kind of very, not especially beautiful at, at all. So I think it should be replaced by something else. Um, I know that we're five minutes over now, but um, I, I guess I just want to thank everyone at Cottage for making this happen. Um, the music you heard in the beginning and that you'll hear in the outro, is by DJ Lengua, uh, other known, known as Eamon Orejiron. And actually he is in the sequence of side B in the videos with his work, uh, Bite Work. And so uh, he's a musician and an amazing artist and um, also in the collection of Codis. And so I wanna thank 
from my heart, Ivan. I want to say Ivana. also that I, I really love to meet Ana Teresa. I hope we met personally soon because uh, it was a very nice conversation and it just, I think it's just a starting. Uh, yes, uh, I, 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 can, I can feel collaboration happening. I have a uh, <laughs> levitate, it's, make it's visible, invisible. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Maybe Katas yeah. can make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, any any final words? Gestures. Uh, oh, tender politics. Tender politics. Tender politics. Tender politics. <laughs> Fuck them all, tender politics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you oh, all I, so I, much. I, I, no, I think there is something important. Also, I, know, I would say something about that. And then it's not only about like, you know, this kind of like physical quality, but um, about like the, the rhetorics of confrontation. I think we also need to fight kind of that, like, we either like I'm, I'm I organize children protests. I uh, like pro protest. I'm uh, like the one who is going out to say out loud what we need to say when something is not okay. But we also need to fight in a way the confrontational rhetoric. So to deconstruct this kind of polarization climate that is kind of winning everywhere in the world. So I think it has to do also with that this idea of tenderness. Like there's not only two ways of solving stuff. There is. Uh, uh, third, fourth way that has to do with contact conversation, and mm -hmm. it's hard to to do. It, it it need you need to love, but you need to learn to give away stuff. And right, amen. <laughs> I'm like touching you, Jordan. <laughs> well I'm said. Reaching. <laughs> well said. We'll get there. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you so much, Anna, Ivan, Julio. It's such a great and moving conversation. It's so great to share that work too and an unseen work. And I mean, just totally inspiring and amazing. So um, thanks everybody. And we hope to see you again real soon, Catist or Beyond.